Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Sam Ashenden. I'm one of the Economy and Society editorial board. I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening to um, the LSE for the Economy and Society Guest Lecture 2009. Um, you may know that ENS is a, a journal that over for over 30 years now, for well over 30 years now, has been committed to advancing some of the best social science, political theory, uh, research. Um, and we are continuing that valiant tradition tonight. Um, serious scholarship about issues central to our present. And I'm extremely, well, extremely glad to be uh, welcoming Tim Mitchell to the LSE on this account, because I think Professor Mitchell's work more than ad amply fits that bill. He is a man who, across uh, the last couple of decades, has done a significant amount of research that, on the surface, looks quite difficult to classify. I mean, it crosses economics, anthropology, sociology, political theory, um, geography, to name just a few conventional academic disciplines. Um, and I suppose that um, one of the things that uh, is, is most inspiring about that from my point of view is that it's very clearly identifiable as a body of work that has a set of, of driving questions from political theory, but unlike many people who would uh, class themselves as political theorists, Tim's work doesn't fall into that kind of dry normative uh, framework of abstracting from the world in order to think. It's rather diving into the world in order to think. And this is what he promises us this evening, I think. Tim is currently a professor in the Department of Middle East and Asian Languages and Cultures in the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, he's written extensively about power and knowledge, colonialism, uh, political economy of development, agrarian politics and the politics of oil. You can find him writing about the politics of oil in the current issue of Economy and Society in an article I would very strongly recommend to you. He's written an um, extensive number of articles, but Colonizing Egypt and Rule of Experts, Egypt, Technopolitics and Modernity, um, two key texts. And he promises us a book some way down the line, which you may help to shape this evening. And that book will be continuing on the theme of oil and politics with a provisional title of Carbon Democracy. So I'd like to welcome Tim Mitchell. Thank you very much, uh, Sam Ashenden, for that uh, very warm uh, introduction to Professor Stuart Corbridge uh, for the opportunity also to be here tonight and to the Editorial Board of Economy and Society for asking me to give this lecture. We're entering the declining decades of the fossil fuel era, that brief period of human time during which coal miners and oil workers moved an extraordinary quantity of energy buried underground in coal seams and hydrocarbon traps, up to the Earth's surface, where engines, oilers, blast furnaces, and turbines burned it at an ever-increasing rate, providing the mechanical force that made possible modern industrial life, the modern city, and suburb industrialized agriculture, the chemically transformed world of synthetic materials, electric power and communication, mass politics, global trade, and military-run empire. Fossil fuels will last many more decades, but two crises threaten the world based upon them. First, we're using up conventional stores of oil, the main source of carbon energy, faster than producers can discover new supplies. The flow of oil from most of the world's large oil regions, such as the North Sea, is rapidly declining. In the UK, the production of fossil fuels has just collapsed by 40% in the space of the last decade. The world needs to add three million barrels a day of new capacity just to keep up with this collapse in production from existing fields, equivalent to a new Saudi Arabia every three years. During the last 10 years, only about 40% of the global oil we consumed in flow was replaced by new discoveries. As a result, after many years of growth, in 2004, the production of oil reached a plateau, even though the price was rising by 25% a year, and every producer was pumping the maximum. The oil supply stopped growing, and from then on, the world had to get by with no net increase in supplies. 
Official estimates still predict reserves uh, are plentiful, although perhaps only for another decade or two. And we may in fact have already entered a period in which the flow of fossil fuels for the first time in the 150 year age of carbon energy can no longer continuously increase. Second, the burning of these supplies of oil, most of which have been used up just in the years since 1950, has taken carbon that was once stored underground and placed it in the atmosphere where it's caused the warming of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans that now threatens to result in catastrophic climate change. The problems of peak oil, as they're known, and of climate breakdown are connected, yet a surprising difference separates them. Uncertainty over the future of the Earth's climate and the ecological balance of its biosphere is the object of a great deal of scientific investigation, political debate, media discussion, and grassroots organizing. Uncertainty over the future of oil is not. The reasons for this difference in the politics of calculation are what I'm going to start this talk about from today. They raise questions of political theory, questions about the government of uncertainty of how we measure the future and how to take measures for the future. They illustrate problems of political calculation, how to calculate for a world without oil, a question that asks not how we should think about a future world without carbon energy. As I said, the oil is not necessarily going to run out right away, and new sources of gas appear suddenly abundant, but rather how to calculate for a world without counting oil and without counting on oil. One of the differences between the politics of climate change and the politics of peak oil is in the difference of counting. This is so in more than one sense. First, as we'll see, in the sense of the metrology, the, the forms of measurement. Climate change became a science in the field of political action by building measuring devices. Technical devices were also widely used to estimate reserves of oil in many parts of the world, but these were not connected together into publicly available knowledge for counting worldwide changes in the Earth's reserves of oil. Partly for this reason, it's never been possible to estimate reliably how much oil is left. I'll come back to that question. But secondly, global reserves of oil could not be counted, but they could be counted on. There were always reserves available. For most of the 20th century, in fact, there was too much of it. And occasional shortages in the production of those reserves could be quickly overcome. One could count on the future availability of oil. For these reasons, oil could be counted on in a further sense. Its ready availability in ever increasing quantities, and mostly at relatively low and stable prices, meant that it could be counted on not to count. It could be consumed as if there were no need to take account of the fact that it was not replenishable. In turn, not having to count the cost of using up with the space of a century or two, most of the Earth's limited stores of fossil fuel made another kind of counting possible, new kinds of economic calculation. The economy we now know, and as I've explored in a number of articles, came into being as an object of calculation only in the mid-20th century, about 150 years after it's conventionally said to have become an object of discourse. Its appearance was made possible, I would argue, by oil. Before the 1930s or 1940s, no economist used the term the economy in its modern sense to refer to an object that could be measured and made to grow. Previous efforts at calculating the totality of economic life tried to calculate material wealth and resources, so they had to take into account things wearing out or depreciating, things being used twice, for example, when goods were traded wholesale and then resold in retail. One had to avoid counting both those transactions, or things being used up that could not be replaced. Alfred Marshall's Principles of Economics argued a century ago that using up of non-renewable resources is carefully calculated. In the case of energy, for example, as part of the rent paid for coal mines, in the coal age, one could calculate in these terms. In the United States, again, a century ago, leading economists like Richard T. Ely, the founder of the American Economics Association, and Thorsten Veblen, became preoccupied with questions of resources and their depletion, with excess or conspicuous consumption, as Veblen called it, and with the dissipation or conservation of energy. 
The discipline of economics, in their view, was to be a study of these questions of material flows and resources. But they lost the battle to shape the discipline to the rival forces of price theorists. Economics became, instead, a science of money. Its object was not the material forces of nature and human labor, but, by the mid-century, the economy. Several developments made it possible by the middle decades of the century to devise the forms of calculation that made it possible to talk about and manage the national economy. I won't summarize the larger argument about the emergence of the economy in that period now, but just to say something about the place of oil in that transformation. Since one was now in the Keynesian economy counting essentially money changing hands, including the same money changing hands many times, the economy was an object that could grow without getting physically bigger. Economic discourse no longer referred to a system with material limits. This dematerialization was aided, I think, by oil. There was no way to calculate its depletion, so there was no real cost. The birth of the economy, based upon the widespread ability of oil, made possible a new forms of politics that was dematerialized or denatured. The politics of nature that Bruno Latour describes, a politics that has been artificially divorced from nature and that he traces back to enlightenment roots and to the role of the natural sciences, was constructed perhaps, at least in the 20th century, not by the natural sciences, as by the science of economics. Oil that could be counted on could provide the basis for practices of calculation, for novel practices of calculation, because it could not be counted. So the question today of peak oil is a question of how to count the oil, of what will happen if we can no longer count on oil, and of how to count, that is to say, how to carry out political calculation without counting on the fact that oil itself cannot be counted. The difference between peak oil and climate change is found not only in different histories and politics of calculation. These differences appear to correspond to very different forms and degrees of political debate and action. The threat of climate collapse is now the object of international treaties and protocols. Sustained government action, however inadequate the actual measures taken, publications, protests, political pressure organized by many large national and international organizations. There are no major international pressure groups or activist organizations mobilized around peak oil. In Britain, the one political party that has made peak oil a pillar of its platform is the British National Party. In the wake of the September 2000 fuel protests when lorry drivers and farmers across Western Europe blockaded oil refineries and blocked motorways in a brief round of protest in 2005, the BNP, a party sympathetic to those who reject the evidence of climate change, calculated that its program of white supremacy and anti-Muslim xenophobia would be enhanced by the coming crisis of peak oil. The fuel protests had shown that a movement led from the right could paralyze the country. The strikes of January of this year at the Lindsay Oil Refinery in protest against jobs going to Portuguese and Italian workers housed in barges in nearby docks, which shut down the third largest oil refinery in the country and spread to refineries elsewhere, suggested further opportunities to transform the politics of fuel supply into a field for recruitment to movements on the right. But even mainstream politics takes up the xenophobic potential of energy politics, denouncing dependence on foreign oil, referring explicitly to the dangers of relying on oil produced in Arab or Muslim-majority countries. So do rising fuel prices and coming shortages of oil presage a new kind of politics, a politics of refinery strikes, truck driver protests, the blockading of fuel depots, and the shutting down of pipelines? This kind of question has an interesting history, and it's part of that history that I uh, refer to in the article Carbon Democracy that uh, appeared in the August issue of the journal Economy and Society. A century ago, the widespread use of coal gave workers an entirely new power. The movement of unprecedented quantities of carbon fuel along narrow channels created vulnerable points where a slowdown or a strike could paralyze, for the first time, an entire energy system. The new word sabotage, originally meaning a slowdown or a work to rule, 
was coined to describe the new power of French coal miners and railway workers. The organization of something called a general strike, ridiculed as an impractical dream by Frederick Engels as late as the 1870s, or if he said if it were practical, it would be pointless, because if workers were ever strong enough to organize a general strike, they would already be more powerful than the state, so the detour through having a strike would be pointless. Became that, that, that instrument uh, became possible as a powerful political tool that did not actually require workers to be already more powerful than the state. Rather, relatively small numbers of workers linked together by the very movement of coal and concentrated at key points along its route could now, for the first time, shut down the productive resources of an entire country thanks to the new dependence on coal. The novel ability to interrupt energy supplies played a key role, that article argues, in facilitating the emergence of modern welfare democracies. In the second half of the 20th century, governments engineered a switch from coal to oil and gas, partly to weaken this political power. We know the story of Thatcher and the British coal miners, but as early as the 1940s, the architects of the Marshall Plan in Washington argued for subsidizing oil to defeat the left. The successes of miners and railway workers in Europe and North America were not replicated by the oil workers who would replace the coal workers, the oil workers, that is, of the Middle East that the Marshall Plan subsidized, the, the oil industry, the workers in the oil industry of the Middle East that the Marshall Plan deliberately subsidized for this reason. The workers of Dahran, of Abadan, of Kirkuk, or at the pipeline terminals and refineries on the coasts of Palestine and Lebanon did not have the same opportunities that the coal workers had had a generation or two before in Europe. Differences in the material properties of oil the fact that it comes out of the ground initially largely under its own pressure by sending a work, rather than by sending a workforce down. The fact that uh, it moves by pipeline very often rather than by rail. The much greater distances it can travel because of the larger amount of energy per weight. The dislocation with the rise of Middle Eastern oil between sites of energy production and places of its main consumption. Structures of ownership that enabled workers' demands in the Middle East to be translated or mistranslated into programs of nationalization so as to divert the other kinds of goals that the workers themselves were fighting for. These and many other socio-technical features of oil, in contrast to coal, made efforts to build out of oil production a mechanism of mass politics, increasingly difficult in the second half of the 20th century. So today, what, might, what kind of politics might follow from the declining flow of oil and other fossil fuels? Greenpeace advocates a decentralized energy system, dispensing with the electrical grid and turning every building into a generator of heat and power. Decentralizing energy, they argue, by reducing the influence of large, powers, large power and energy firms would, they say, also democratize energy. Proponents of giant solar power stations in the Sahara disagree, arguing that an electrical grid, such as the circum-Mediterranean network that they propose, is an effective market device, allowing price competition, the balancing of supply and demand, the stabilizing of voltages, and the increased use of renewables. Many attempts to answer these kinds of questions about the politics that will flow from new kinds of energy supply fall into some kind of energy determinism, as though each form of energy produced a corresponding politics and implying that we have to wait for the energy transformation to occur and then discover the politics that will follow, a Malthusian kind of approach. They follow, as it were, the lead of the BNP. The importance of energy politics is that while in the past it has contributed decisively to the shaping of political possibility, today it seems to me it's become a field of enormous uncertainty. The political possibilities not, lie not in a future defined by Malthusian resource constraints or other futures to be determined by either the laws of nature or by technical determinism, but in this fact of uncertainty. We can draw here on the book by Michel Callon, Acting in an Uncertain World, which appeared in English translation earlier this year. Callon and his colleagues argue that far from politics being determined by natural forces or 
by the development of new technology. Or conversely, politics that's being freed from natural constraints by the progress of science and technology, is another view has it. We find ourselves in the midst of an ever-increasing number of technical controversies. Technical change does not remove uncertainties. It causes them to proliferate. Kalanis and his colleagues argue that such technical controversies and uncertainties are always socio-technical controversies. They're disputes about the kind of technologies we want to live with, but also about the forms of social life, that is to say of socio-technical life, we would like to live. They create uncertainty not simply because they reach the boundaries of our technical or our scientific knowledge, but because of the way other kinds of boundaries are breached. Two kinds of boundaries are threatened by these uncertainties. First, as Bruno Latour also argues in The Politics of Nature, the boundary between society and nature, as we think of it. Controversies cannot be settled by experts alone because they involve questions not only about the nature of the world, the arena traditionally monopolized in the modern era by scientific and technical expertise, but also about the nature of the collective. That distinction, of course, as Latour argues, between nature and society has always been an unreal one, but it's the way it, it, it's very embedded in the structure of disciplines, in the structure of, uh, uh, of, of the academy, in the structure of forms of political expertise has made it an a, a increasingly impossible one to eradicate despite all the ways in which uh, we construct for ourselves worlds that um, do not fit into any distinction between two separate realms of that sort. The second kind of threat, um, uh, the kind of boundary threatened by these kinds of uncertainties, uh, is, that, is, is that they overflow, Calon suggests, the separation between experts and lay persons. The overflow occurs because in increasing numbers of ways, the construction of technical expertise itself involves the participation of lay persons. I think that's true uh, of the case of the, the construction of expertise about the question of oil, though it's not one that I'm going to have time to explore um, in the lecture tonight, but I'm happy to talk about it. In these situations, um, political subjects become subjects themselves of technical experiments and participants in those experiments. That kind of development, Callan argues, is not a threat to democratic politics, but actually provides an opportunity to, as he puts it, democratize democracy. Can we draw on these ways of thinking to think about the question of peak oil? Does the uncertainty over the future of fossil fuels create a set of questions that cannot be contained by the distinction between nature and society, between the resources of nature on the one hand and the kind of social order that can be sustained on the other? or between the expertise that speaks about facts of nature and the non-experts who ask to accept the word of experts and delegate to professional politicians the decisions to be made on the basis of those natural or technical facts. If controversies overflow this distinction, do they create a new kind of political space, a forum in which the composition of the collective is at stake in questions over possible states of the world? My answer is going to be that the question of energy politics suggests a somewhat different view of the politics of nature to the one offered by Latour and Calon. For much of the 20th century, the boundary between nature and society has been established not as a vulnerable line created by the rise of the natural sciences since the Enlightenment, but rather as a broad space, the territory that we call the economic. The separation of nature from politics is maintained not so much by natural scientists who monopolize statements about nature, but more so by economists who police, as it were, the no man's land between the two. Energy, and especially oil production, has provided a key field for establishing the very divide between nature and society, or what oil companies like to call below ground and above ground. And it's in the uncertain future of the world's energy system that one finds some of the more significant challenges today to this economization of the space of nature and society. I noted a moment ago that one of the differences between the politics of climate change and the politics of peak oil 
lies in the forms of measurement that have made it possible to construct a science of climate change, but not of oil. In the 1950s, oceanographers and chemists from the Scripps Institution in La Jolla in Southern California began to use infrared gas analyzers at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii to measure the changing concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and to correlate these observations with those at other remote locations. They developed the infrared analyzers to measure changes in the composition of gases in the atmosphere caused by the testing of US atomic weapons on islands in the Pacific. But one of the things they discovered was not issues of nuclear fallout, but the increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, unconnected with nuclear weapons testing. The World Meteorological Organization subsequently organized a World Climate Conference, and out of the later meetings of that organization, it formed with the United Nations Environment Program, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, whose assessment reports, as you know, appear every six or seven years, uh, the next one being due uh, in about five years' time. In 1992, and it, it didn't stop with that, in 1992, it's, uh, the World Meteorological Organization set up the uh, Global Climate Observing System to coordinate production measurements and so on. The field of climate change, both as a subject of scientific study and as a focus of political organizing and debate, one can argue was made possible by the elaboration of this system of measurements. Now, it's not that oil doesn't have that. In fact, a parallel set of measuring devices and calculative infrastructures does exist for oil. In fact, it's probably far more extensive. Oil com companies collect information on, on the reservoirs themselves, measures of porosity, water saturation, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, and, and recovery factors, uh, data on the wells, their location, depth, core analysis, stem tests, history and location of dry wells, mechanical logs, data on geophysics, the prospect maps, the seismic sections, and so on, and data on geochemistry, the type of source rocks, the burial history of those rocks in geological time, their maturation history, and so on. All that information is compiled. But there are three very significant differences between these measurements and those concerning climate change. First, measurements attempting to predict the future supply of oil sample the lithosphere, not the atmosphere or the biosphere. They are sampling a space that is fractured, inaccessible, an irregular mixture of solid, liquid, and gas, of the viscous and the semi-viscous, of the porous and the semi-porous, the permeable and the impermeable. All of these elements interact in a dynamic, pressurized system of seepages, flows, fracturing, folding, and flooding. The knowledge that results from that fractured space is partial, particular to a given location, probabilistic rather than deterministic, and difficult to aggregate. The second difference is that the measurements that oil companies make in this way, unlike meteorological measurements, are almost never made public. These two differences are related. An oil reservoir is a carbon energy machine, an apparatus of heat, pressure, fluid migration, and seismic movement that generates rare and potent stores of buried solar energy. The geological processes that make measurements so difficult are themselves the source of the extraordinary wealth whose size and vulnerability makes oil companies unwilling to publicize those measurements. To those two differences, we can add a third one, likewise related. Petroleum reserves cannot be measured directly. They're estimates of future production as well as present, which have to be calculated under conditions that include economic assumptions and knowledge of the technical feasibility of projects in the future to extract the resources. The fractured and increasingly difficult to reach geological formations in which oil is found today makes the size of reserves increasingly dependent upon this unmeasurable estimate of the likelihood that the equipment can be devised to discover and extract those reserves. It further depends on the fact, of course, that the carbon released from these underground geological stores ends up in the atmosphere. So efforts to protect against climate collapse will affect 
the rate at which oil itself can be extracted to the extent that they become effective. All that becomes part of the definition of oil reserves. As a result, no apparatus has been put in place to parallel those of the World Meteorological Organization or the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change to create a science of peak oil based on global petroleum uh, estimates. There exist equivalent public bodies, the US Geological Survey, more recently the Paris-based International Energy Agency, which is established by the OECD in 1974, and the United States Energy Information Administration, which dates from the same year. These, by and large, do not have access to company information. They do not install, operate, or coordinate measuring devices. I'm not going to describe today the interesting history of how they got around this problem, of how these national and international agencies, deprived of access to the devices and procedures that actually measure the oil in the ground, produced, nevertheless, estimates of how much oil altogether there might be, although it's an interesting history, and one with its own connections, like that of climate change, to the, to, to the, to the Cold War problems of measurement. <coughs> Estimating, um, so having skipped that interesting history, I'm afraid, the um, Estimating just the size of the 102 largest, uh, what are called total petroleum systems in the world, this is how the US Ge Ge Geological Survey operates, estimating these 102 uh, total petroleum systems that contain the vast uh, majority of the world's uh, oil, possible oil reserves, making a set of questionable assumptions that certain features of the history of oil discovery in the US, the world's oldest petroleum region, can serve as a model for future uh, discovery patterns elsewhere in the world under very different geological, technical, legal, and political conditions. Despite all that, these expert bodies have produced astonishingly optimistic estimates of the world's undiscovered and unknown reserves of oil. Nature, Bruno Latour tells us, is a way of assembling the world without due process. The appeal to nature, to those undiscovered reserves, shortcuts political debate and contestation. Nature is understood as a realm of facts, separate from values, from the messy, subjective world of politics. Only experts are fully equipped to explore the world of nature, reporting their findings back to the political world in incontestable form. The case of oil suggests a different account of how the nature society divide is assembled and maintained, an account in which a critical role in the government of technical uncertainty is performed by the economic. This extraordinary gap that I've just suggested between, on the one hand, the proven reserves, that, uh, that section of the reserves compiled largely from the privately held company data, on the one hand, and the estimate of unknown, undiscovered reserves of oil based on these other measurement techniques using a concept of total petroleum systems and similar forms of uncertainty. The extraordinary gap between what is known and what is estimated of, about the unknown opens up a space that is occupied by this other kind of expert, the oil economist. This is how we govern the separation of nature from society of nature from politics. How does that happen? If the oil being produced, as these two rival systems of estimation and calculation suggest, if the oil now being produced is only such a small part of the total of still to be discovered reserves, then the problem of the future supply is an economic question, not a question of geology. As oil company funded consultants like to say, the problem is above ground, not below ground. The obstacles to producing more oil lie in the cost of drilling, the level of demand, and thus the price, which needs to rise to make it feasible to search for and produce oil in the more inaccessible places where it is thought still to lie. The restrictions placed on drilling by environmental campaigns that prevent the exploitation of, for example, coastal and Arctic regions of the US, and political arrangements or sanctions regimes in the Middle East that limit the access of multinational oil companies to new sources of reserves. Now, none of this, 
put in those terms is necessarily untrue. Oil companies historically developed, in fact, large political intelligence and economic forecasting departments and worked with that distinction between the, form, the, the forms of data that were used uh, on the ground and underground geologically and the forms of data and the forms of information that were used uh, above ground uh, economically and politically. In the era of relatively plentiful oil, investment planning was typically far more dependent, in fact, on these above ground calculations than on the below ground geological or petrochemical calculation. The distinction between above and below ground, however, between economic or political calculation and geology is not a straightforward one. There's no simple distinction between politics and nature, although the oil industry works very hard to maintain one. For example, just to take one instance, while the price of oil partly determines which reserves it is feasible or economic to produce, it's also the case that geological estimates of reserves of oil affect its price. The availability of ample reserves of oil, as indicated by the US Geological Service, by certain production companies and by key producer states, especially Saudi Arabia, encourages investment in oil and dissuades users of petroleum from switching to alternatives, especially to radically different alternatives that require initial investments, um, large initial investments such as renewables or nuclear power. The control of individual measurement and data by corporations and their consulting firms and the publication, on the other hand, of very high estimates of undiscovered oil by agencies compelled by this lack of access to measuring devices and field-level data to operate at a very great level of generality provide the mechanism for maintaining a separation between, nevertheless, despite the ways in which one, one can question the separation, to maintain that apparent separation between above ground and below ground, between society and nature, or actually between economy and nature. I suggested earlier that the birth of the economy as a dematerialized conception of economic flows was enabled by the arrival of oil, an energy source so cheap and so plentiful from the 1930s that a system of general economic calculation could de be devised that made no reference to questions of the exhaustion of non-renewable resources or the cost of energy that made possible the idea of growth in turn without limits. That's not to say that alternatives disappeared In, in the United States, prior to the, the domination of economic thought by neoclassical e economics and the price system, the School of American Institutional Economics that had developed from the work of people like Richard Ely, who I mentioned, and Thorsten Veblen, uh, preoccupied with questions of conservation of resources or with conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. Now, one particular development out of that work, as it was pushed away from the mainstream, was um, uh, the formation of something called the technocracy movement, a New York-based uh, school of economists and engineers and geographers who argued that wealth depended not on the circulation of money, as the neoclassical economists were now able to argue, but on the flow of energy and its transformation into materials and services. They undertook something called the Energy Survey of North America in the 1920s, which gathered data on natural resource extraction, manufacturing, and energy usage. In conjunction with the Department of Industrial Engineering at Columbia University, they then carried out an analysis of production and employment in North America, measured not in financial data, but in energy units. One of the leaders of that movement and of those calculations in the 1920s and 1930s was a geoscientist named Marion King Hubbard. Hubbard, as many of you know, went on to work for the Shell Oil Company, later for the US Geological Survey, and then became famous for a study of the depletion of oil reserves, which in 1956 predicted, accurately as it turned out, that the production of oil in the US and in the lower 48 states would reach a peak no later than the year 1970 and then go into a decline. Hubbard had done studies of the flow of fluids underground. And what he did with oil was he shifted the object of study. It was no longer a question of the total size of an oil reservoir or the quantity of reserves still in the ground. The issue instead was going to be the rate of flow. The rate of flow, he said, unlike the size of ultimate reserves, has a history. And this history follows a typical pattern shaped by the methods and rates of exploration 
uh, and the exploration and the discovery of oil, by the technologies of extraction, and by the physical properties of different kinds of reservoir rock and of oil. From these kinds of factors, it's possible to predict a probable future flow of oil. For the economists, oil reserves were a fact of nature and were unknowably immense. For Hubbard, the flow of oil was a measurable, physical, but also socio-technical process. Over the last decade, a significant uh, debate has organized around Hubbard's work and more generally around this question of peak oil, not just uh, in the United States where Hubbard studied, but for the world as a whole. And his methods have been used to predict the point at which production of oil will peak. And many of those estimates suggest that we have reached that point already. There have been two kinds of responses from the oil economists, from the, the cornucopian oil economists. First, they argue that the availability of conventional oil is largely now a political question. Most um, expansion of future supply will come from the countries of OPEC, and in particular from the three main producers in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq, each of which is reported to have vast, untapped reserves. I'm not going to address here the complexities of this question. I'll just note that there are, first of all, strong reasons to suspect that the reserves of these three countries are vastly overstated. Second, that the political obstacle that is referred to, the inaccessibility of the Middle East, is also a geotechnical problem. It's below ground as much as above ground, because sanctions regimes and war over the last de two decades forced Iran and Iran to resort to low-tech means of maintaining pressure in oil reservoirs and thus the flow of oil to the uh, wellhead, which may have permanently limited the amount of oil that is recoverable. And thirdly, that those two issues aside, the fact that oil supply is now acknowledged to be a political issue involving questions of war, of human rights, of collective futures, is precisely the argument for a new kind of politics of nature to replace the old economization of the space between nature and politics. So if, if talking about the great potential of those OPEC countries is one response by the cornucopians, the other is a redefinition of nature itself, or at least that part of it represented by oil. Almost all oil produced so far in the world is now called conventional oil. This reflects the fact that um, the only significant discoveries of new oil is occurring very deep offshore, at depths usually of tens of thousands of feet. Everyone more or less agrees that the supply of conventional oil from most of the world will start declining soon if it has not already begun. But apart from the possibility of a few more deep offshore sites. Uh, we are to be saved from the political uncertainties and reorientation that this uh, coming decline of oil, the flow of oil uh, represents. Um, by a process of defining other kinds of things as oil. Uh, unconventional oil, as it's called, to which we can now also add unconventional reserves of gas. As with the reference to Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, the interesting thing about this question of unconventional reserves is the way they threaten to transform the politics of nature. Unconventional oil refers to two kinds of minerals. The first and largest is a rock formation that is now known as oil shale. The rock is an organic milestone and contains not oil but kerogen, an organic material that has not undergone the full geological process over hundreds of thousands of years of conversion by pressure and heat into oil. But with the assistance of humans, this geological process can be speeded up and carried out artificially. With conventional oil, the heavy crude brought out of the ground is broken down into lighter hydrocarbons, such as gasoline, petrol, by the process known as pyrolysis or cracking, applying heat to break long chain hydrocarbon molecules into shorter chains. With these kerogen rich shales, the rock itself is to be converted into synthetic oil by pyrolysis. 
However, excavating the rock and processing it in this way above ground has proved prohibitively expensive and energy intensive. So pilot programs are now underway experimenting with synthesizing oil from rock in situ by turning the subterranean deposit site into a vast retort. Heating the rock over a period of months to 650, 700 degrees Fahrenheit and then pumping up the liquidized kerogen. This also involves freezing the perimeter of the production zone to construct ice walls to stop the flow of groundwater in or kerogen out. In other words, to become economically feasible, you have to move the pyrolytic process underground, leaving the mineral in place and carrying out the chemical transformation by turning the earth into a giant cracking machine. So one must first replace a geological process of oil formation carried out over millennium with a human and mechanical one, and one must then transform the lithosphere itself from nature into a machine by moving the site of the synthetic process underground, turning geology into a machine. Despite decades of government funding in the US, none of this has yet proved feasible. The second form of unconventional oil is what is known as oil sands, especially the Athabasca oils in, in Alberta and Canada and the Orinoco Basin sands in Venezuela. This too is not oil as conventionally known. It's bitumen, the heaviest and most viscous fraction of oil traditionally used for road surfacing, but recently renamed unconventional oil to maintain the cornucopian future. The Athabasca tars have been mined since the 1960s, but were reclassified as part of Canada's oil reserves only in 2002, causing those reserves to jump from five to 150 billion barrels of proven reserves. So that Canada now has the second highest reserves of oil in any country of the world after Saudi Arabia. As with shale oil, um, the tar sand has to be artificially transformed into a synthetic crude oil. The collapse in oil prices last winter brought the uh, Alberta industry uh, almost to a standstill, but even if it recovers, it faces further problems. With oil sands, nature, as it were, is no longer buried out of sight underground. The oil has to be produced by strip mining the sands on the surface, which is ecologically controversial. And the processing of the bitumen requires large amounts of water to remove the sand. The sand also contains other things, uh, besides the tar that is to be extracted, including nickel, vanadium, lead, chromium, mercury, arsenic, selenium, and other toxic elements. These are collected in storage ponds with so far no means of disposal. There is a very real risk of overflows. Um, the threat both to, to the, the river system itself in Alberta, to wildlife, uh, is significant. In other words, nature has been brought back into the question of the future of oil in a rather unexpected sense. Not simply because the environmental movement is strong in Canada or that strip mining is so controversial, but because energy itself no longer lies conveniently <coughs> underground in the almost ready to use form of nature in which it was known in the 20th century. There's a similar story today with the production of what is now called unconventional natural gas. Conventional oil and natural gas flow to the wellhead by migrating through pores and fissures in the source rock. Natural gas, however, also exists in large quantities in shales, which are not porous or permeable enough to produce a commercially viable flow of gas. However, by setting off controlled explosions in the concrete wall of the well shaft and then pumping down the well under high pressure, a mixture of fluid and sand, natural gas producers can now mechanically fracture the rock to make it fissured and porous. By analogy with the high pressure breakdown of hydrocarbons in conventional oil production known as cracking, this high pressure fracturing of the shale beds is known as fracking. The millions of gallons of water used in the hydraulic fracking fluid includes acids and toxic chemicals whose use is not regulated. The oil and gas industry is in fact the only industry in the United States that can pump chemicals into the subsoil without the approval of the Environmental Protection Agency. The fluid is trucked to the well site, typically in tankers, and stored for reuse in surface tanks, which can leak. Shale reservoirs in the US are found at a variety of depths, 250 feet to 8,000. The shallower reservoirs may be close to water sources used by humans. The chemicals are indeed now showing up as contaminated drinking water supplies. Whereas oil 
is now, conventional oil is now discovered only, for the most part, very deep offshore, adding to the cost and difficulty of using it, but helping to separate nature from politics. Part of the attraction of shale gas is that new sites like the Marcellus Shale Formation in Pennsylvania, New York State, and potential sites in Europe lie very close to large population centers, reducing, of course, the transportation costs. But this means it's also found close to large drinking water supplies, remixing politics and nature. Let me conclude. I suggested at the start that 20th century politics was constructed around a new object, the economy, and the politics of the economy was a denatured politics. Not so much in the general way, since the, in, uh, following from the, the very history of the Enlightenment that Latour uh, suggests in the politics of nature, where nature is reserved for natural scientists who are the only persons authorized to speak about facts of nature. Rather, nature was excluded from politics in the 20th century by very specific practices of calculation. First, by ways of constructing the economy as a dematerialized circulation of money, made possible in part by not having to count the cost of using energy or of using the up. Second, today, since the 1990s, by the introduction of cornucopian techniques for representing the size of the world's energy reserves. These techniques rest on the peculiar arrangement by which entirely separate calculative agencies carry out the counting of oil using different methods of calculation. The oil companies count individual wells and reservoirs with the use of elaborate measuring devices. The international agencies count global reserves relying on the abstractions and models of geological theory. The two methods produce very different totals. This gap between the declining quantity of known oil and the expanding quantity of unknown yet to be discovered oil creates a space, a space to be governed by economic calculation. However, challenged by the evidence of peak oil that more than half the world's conventional reserves may have already been exhausted, and that the supply of oil from those sources is on a plateau and already declining, the economist's cornucopian account can survive only by opening up anew the politics of nature. It does so inadvertently by acknowledging that the size and accessibility of OPEC oil reserves is a question of political, not economic calculation, and by a redefinition of oil to include unconventional minerals. But this redefinition of oil is a redefinition of nature. It opens up the risk that the methods of organization and calculation that have excluded nature from politics will no longer operate. To transform kerogen impregnated rock formations and bitumen filled sands into, the oil, fi into oil fields turns nature into a machinated artificial territory in which all kinds of novel claims and political agencies can form. To acknowledge that the size uh, of the main source of conventional reserves in the Gulf is an uncertain techno-political question, not an economic one, and not one simply of natural resources, places the economic management of political uncertainty once again in question. It is in these kinds of possibility, rather than any kind of energy determinism, that the future politics of energy will unfold. Thank you. say thank you to Tim for what I thought was an extremely interesting lecture and I would like once people have left the room to invite those of you who have questions to raise your hands I will try to take questions in groups of three I think that will probably work best and if you could wait until the roving microphone reaches you that would be enormously helpful um, Hello, uh, Professor Tim Mitchell. Uh, earlier in your presentation, you said that measurement by oil companies are never made public. Um, as far as I know, in some countries, uh, there is a legal requirement to make um, uh, public, uh, to make these oil companies uh, present uh, the results of their exploration and of, and of their development and potential environmental impact assessment to public, and also. I know about the Aarhus Convention, you're probably aware. Aarhus Convention, mm -hmm. 
and many countries has, have already ratified this. Uh, in your statement, do you mean that uh, this uh, case of American oil companies, or do you mean there's some specific measurements that are not made public? Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question over here from Black Jacket. Professor Mitchell, um, your uh, distinction between the spheres of the um, society and um, nature uh, has illuminated uh, my understanding of the politics of oil. However, um, in, my, in my view, it is predicated on a different distinction, which is that between the sphere of politics and the sphere of the economy. Um, my sense is that uh, markets are venues in which the different actors uh, can manifest their own opinions. And so um, an understanding of the economy in which it is not um, a conspiracy of uh, traders who have a homogeneous view, but different uh, decision makers with different perceptions of what those reserves are may suggest a different conception of what those politics of oil. And right at the back with a white shirt. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Pink shirt. <laughs> Professor, the Stone Age did not end because we are out of stone. Will the Oil Age end because we are out of oil? A, a, a famous question. Um, thank you very much. I'll take those three. Uh, the legal requirement to make reserves public. Uh, uh, legal regimes enormous, uh, vary enormously uh, from place to place. But what I was referring to, the, the information that's not made public is, is the field-by-field field, uh, data of um, uh, oil production, um, oil reserves, and so on. Uh, as far as I know, the only country that makes field-by-field field production data available publicly is Norway. Uh, I may be wrong, um, but it's generally not um, uh, a practice in, in most uh, oil-producing oil uh, states and um, where, where it's a state-owned oil company and um, it's, it's not um, practice in the commercial sector. Um, but I, I probably should have been a little more specific about the kind of, of, of data that I was talking about that is, is kept largely private. Um, the question of uh, what I was saying about the construction of the difference between society and nature compared to the destruction, uh, construction of the difference between uh, politics and uh, the economy and um, the role of markets. I'm not sure that I um, fully uh, un understood the implications of the question. Let me make a couple of remarks that may um, I, I, I illuminate all that. I mean, at one level, when I'm talking in sort of general terms and certainly referring to the La Tour Calon debate about the politics of nature, um, one, one's using those terms to, uh, to stand in for those terms of, of nature versus society, a sort of general division of the world between uh, those two things, the human and the non-human, the, um, uh, the, the realm of the world that is the subject of uh, the social sciences and the realm of the world that is the subject of the natural sciences um, and the ways in which that division of, uh, of knowledge and the production of the knowledge um, has affected not only the shape of the academy but uh, the kinds of intellectual tools we have to understand a politics uh, in which uh, uh, those distinctions don't actually apply. Um, a, a kind of politics, a, a kind of world that is increasingly uh, peopled by all kinds of hybrids of those two things, things that are part human and part non-human, part technical and part natural, part uh, ha have properties of agency and, and, and properties of natural forces and so on. Um, and so uh, sometimes when one's talking in those terms, the, the term society can stand in for uh, forms of knowledge that I include a, a group of the social science disciplines and, and not just um, uh, one particular discipline. Uh, at the same time, of course, one of the things I was trying to add to that um, debate uh, that is represented in one form by the work of uh, the Paris School of Science and Technology Studies is to try and think more carefully about the role that the economic has paid 
and to ask whether or not, in fact, uh, at least for the middle decades of the 20th century, um, a decisive role was played in, in, in creating this middle ground between the two uh, with the novel conception and set of practices that brought into being the economy. Um, and it's a, a, a funny thing that um, among the social sciences, one might think that economics would be the one most concerned with the material world. Um, uh, and perhaps in a certain conception, earlier conception of political economy, that was the case in the 18th century, let's say. Um, the, 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 the discipline that is most concerned, um, ostensibly, with questions of the material world and with ways of thinking about uh, resources is, as it were, the most dematerialized uh, of the social sciences. And that this, this nature politics, nature society separation has been aided by the creation of that huge no man's land between the two that is, uh, ha has been occupied for many of the central decades by, by a dematerialized uh, form of thinking. Now, um, there's all kinds of ways in which things are changing, and one of the ways in which things are changing is, of course, within the economics profession, the abandoning, uh, particularly in the United States, of Keynesianism, of the entire concern with the macro um, and um, its replacement with uh, a, a rather different concern with the market and with the market as a, as a set of technical devices, uh, not simply as a sort of universal form of practice, but a, 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 a set of almost engineering tools that can be brought into play uh, in various places for various purposes. Um, there's a whole history of that that can be thought about, the, the work, the original work of uh, neoliberal e economists going back to, um, to Hayek to actually combat the threat of Keynesianism by articulating a conception of, of, the economy, uh, of, of the market as a rival, as a direct rival to the conception of the economy, and, and, and one that indeed succeeds from, uh, in the wake of the oil crisis of 1974 to displace Keynesianism and to displace uh, that focus on, on, on the macro. Um, and one could also trace the way in which um, oil itself became a field in which market devices could be developed um, in order to take over from um, uh, transnational corporations the, the process of price setting, uh, a process they'd lost control of, of course, in that crisis. Um, I don't think I've answered your question, but then I, I don't know that I fully understood it, and maybe you want, you want to come back, but uh, that's the kind of way in which I would address um, uh, that, that question of, uh, of, of markets in particular. Um, the, the pink shirt, um, the um, Stone Age didn't own a, a end for, uh, because of a shortage of stones, and the Oil Age won't um, end because of a shortage of oil. That, of course, is the very well-known statement um, often attributed to one of the OPEC leaders, but uh, actually coined by some. It was, it's attributed to Yamani, but he didn't uh, coin it. Somebody else, he popularized it. Um, uh, I believe somebody else coined it. Um, uh, exactly, but not for the reasons Sheikh Yamani says or uh, other uh, boosters of, of cornucopian views of the oil. Um, uh, the... Um, uh, I mean, what's implied, of course, in that, and particularly the reference to the Stone Age, is, is, is that the future is going to be determined by forms of technological process rather than uh, natural resource limits. Um, resources are, are limitless. Um, uh, the, um, and, and that debate is so successful for precisely these reasons, that, that argument is so successful precisely for these reasons of the impossibility uh, uh, of, of knowing um, something unknowable, the, 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 the existence of what exists under the ground. Um, the, the response to the Sheikh Yomani line among the peak oil theorists, starting with Hubbard onwards, is we're not talking about the total amount of oil. We're talking about the rate of flow of oil. And that is measurable. And the rate of flow of oil has a history, uh, as, as I alluded to briefly, and um, one can study that history and one can relate that history um, to uh, the rate of uh, discovery. The oil has to be discovered before um, it, it can be produced. Um, the rate at which production from current wells and current reservoirs is declining, um, and whether discoveries uh, 
are keeping up with the pace of the decline of oil from wells that now exist. And that is, is where one finds very strong evidence for um, the coming uh, shortage of oil. Um, uh, now, that said, uh, on the other hand, one can agree with the statement because um, declining flows of oil are interacting with a whole set of other uh, political factors, not least of which um, the, the discussions going on uh, next month in Copenhagen and the question whether uh, industrialized countries in particular are going to commit to a much, much more radical program of r reduction in carbon emissions. Um, e even, the, e even the most extreme forecasts of how much oil is left uh, produce a figure of how much oil that if we were actually to produce it, we would be destroying the planet. Um, so uh, one doesn't even need the cornucopian forecast to know that uh, we're, we're going to be moving um, uh, fairly rapidly away from an oil-based uh, economy. Okay. Question over here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you've described, uh, I have to say, a, a rather depressing uh, vision of the future, which I, I think you could qualify it as being brutish, cold, and dark. Um, politically, uh, one never wants to sell such a message because, surprisingly enough, very few people want to buy it. Uh, do you have a, a more positive message about the future that you might try and actually sell to somebody? Is the person at the back who had their hand up before still... No? Um, down here at the front, please. Um, you've talked about a lot of the uncertainties and the politics. Um, does that mean how accurate can the price of oil at any one point be, given the massive influence this has on the world, and how um, distorted does this become by speculation in terms of can we ever discover an accurate price at any one time? One more? Only the man of his mouth. <laughs> How important will the role of Russia and Brazil be in the 21st century and oil supply? Thank you. Um, do I have a less depressing message? I thought this was actually uplifting because it was about... <laughs> 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 um, uh, you know, th I think, in a way, the sort of standard peak oil message is a very depressing one. That, um, uh, well, both versions, both the sort of peak oil message is, 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 is a... Is a tends to be a very Malthusian one. Uh, and um, on the other hand, the cornucopian one uh, is depressing if one's worried about things like climate change. So um, uh, to me, um, of course, part of the theme of this talk was to try and move those debates um, away from rival accounts of how much oil there is and to uncover in that process a politics of calculation. Um, and in uncovering a politics of calculation, uncover, as it were, a field of politics. Um, a, a, a field of politics that's um, not determined in advance by knowledge of the, the truth of these figures. Um, and it, it seems to me the, the optimism is um, precisely in realizing that the kind of um, sort of political compact we've had in the past with a separation um, between the knowledge of nature in the hands of one set of actors and the knowledge of um, uh, uh, politics um, in, in another set of actors um, is, is far more depressing, even if it was reassuring because it produced certain kinds of certainty whereas this, of course, is a politics of uncertainty. Uh, I think in the longer run, that kind of uncertainty is, is, suggests um, uh, uh, a, a greater kind of political opening and political possibility. I referred in passing, didn't really have time in this version of the talk to take up, Canon's notion that um, one of the things that these forms of technological uncertainty and uncertainty about our technical future do is that they sort of challenge the separation between uh, expert knowledge and lay knowledge. And um, he gives examples of medical research where the patients themselves become contributors to the construction of knowledge about their bodies in all kinds of very significant ways. Um, 
What's interesting to me about the debates about oil is that there is this um, very clear distinction between those who produce um, the optimistic futures and those who produce the more pessimistic futures, but it's not on the whole a distinction between lay and expert knowledge, and that it indicates a rather different distribution of expertise. If you look at the main sources of um, uh, the, the most widely sort of published uh, sources of expert knowledge on the future of oil supplies, the stuff that comes out of um, uh, uh, the the Paris-based organization, the stuff that comes out of um, all the energy consulting firms in the US, the leading one being Sarah, um, uh, the one that's headed by Daniel Jurgen, the economic historian, or the Oxford um, Energy Center um, here in the UK. Um, each one of them is headed by an economist, um, Daniel Jurgen, economist, uh, economic historian, um, uh, others in the US, Michael Lynch, um, who's had a number of recent uh, uh, opinion articles in New York Times and elsewhere, um, uh, boosting the cornucopian view. Uh, Fatih Birol, the, the head of the IEA in Paris, um, uh, uh, e e even um, uh, the colleagues in Oxford. Um, they're all economists or economic historians. Whereas the people uh, producing um, the alternative view tend not to be um, economists. Uh, in many cases have not got professional academic positions, but all tend to have some professional relationship to the oil industry. Um, they're retired petroleum geologists. They are small investors in the petroleum industry um, who have got, they may be small, but they've got very large amounts of money at stake. Um, so one's got, uh, and, and, and others, geologists, all sorts. So one hasn't got a, a sort of distinction between expert knowledge on the one hand being challenged by sort of lay activists on the other. One's got actually um, uh, a very interesting coming together of all kinds of sort of accumulated expertise um, in this peak oil debate that is challenging from a variety of different positions the, 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 the dominant oil economist view. That, to me, that, that very development, I think, is, is, is itself optimistic and, and, and interesting and, and worth sort of documenting and following because it's in these sort of future developments of the way in which expertise is produced and circulated that I think, uh, you know, some of this politics has to be followed. Um, thank you. The, uh, on, uh, how accurate is the price of oil? What about the role of speculators? Is the price accurate? Well, I'm not sure what an accurate price is, but then I'm not an economist. Um, uh, um, I also know there has been, of course, a lot of discussion about the question whether the huge run-up in prices um, uh, in 2008, well, from 2004 to 2008, um, to what extent speculation in the oil futures markets uh, contributed to that, and there's now some efforts, uh, particularly in the US, to limit um, the ability of speculators to affect the price of oil. Bearing in mind, of course, that among those who speculate, or at least who trade in the futures markets, are the oil companies themselves trying to hedge against the fluctuations in price being caused, among other things, by the other speculators. Um, However, I'm not one of those uh, who believe that the thing was entirely uh, constructed by the speculators, and indeed the more evidence we have about um, the difficulties that producers had in um, upping the supply of oil after 2004, I think lends um, much more credence to a set of factors with the flow of oil and the supply of oil. Now, not all of those are absolute limits. Some of them has to do with the rate of constructions of rigs. Some of them have to do with hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, some of them have to do with the war in Iraq and so on. But um, those seem to me uh, equally important factors in, in determining uh, the, the um, slowdown, or, or the, not the slowdown, but the inability of the supply of oil to keep up as it had done always in the past um, with increasing demand. Uh, for, for a sustained period of time. Um, what about Russia and Brazil? Well, um, you know, Russia is sort of in, in the camp of OPEC in a certain sense, that the, the hope that conventional oil might um, be much more uh, uh, abundant than rates of flow suggest relies not only on those three OPEC countries, but also to some extent on um, the flow of oil from Russia. 
the, there was um, a, a big increase in Russian oil flow, um, uh, of course, but that has now leveled off, and I, I believe uh, the, the, the flow is now in decline, and there's a lot of speculation that Russia, too, may have reached a peak and not be the place where the future crisis of oil supplies is going to be solved. Brazil, of course, has had these remarkable offshore discoveries, um, uh, but uh, they're discoveries on a scale that's going to extend the availability of oil or postpone the peak by uh, a year or six months or two years or something of that order um, because, um, uh, as I say, to to deal, uh, th this is the, the recent UK report that just came out a week or so ago, uh, showed that because so many of the world's giant and supergiant fields are in decline, uh, we need a new Saudi Arabia every three years just to replace what we're losing from declining flow from existing fields. And Brazil may be e e enormous. It might even be another Saudi Arabia but we need one of those every three years. So in the long term, um, it, it doesn't seem the solution. Thank you. Um, time for one more round of questions, I think. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned Copenhagen before, and I wanted to ask you about what you think uh, the role of carbon prices might play in the future. Uh, we've We've had a few years of carbon prices already. We have a, a market of about 100 billion, and it's proved to be an extraordinarily volatile market already. And it's um, quite likely to be one of the main devices that uh, emerges from Copenhagen to, to drive policy. And gentlemen in the beige, dare I change the color again? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of recent discussion about the, um, the rebranding of oil companies as energy companies. What do you think is the future of these companies? One last one. Going in front here. Third row back. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question comes from uh, several issues that you have touched. So first of all, the issue of... Um, the challenge of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The second issue um, is more related with the forecast, at least that I do know from International Energy Agency, that is more of the coal issue. I mean, the coming three decades that the coal will start replacing oil. Um, and the third point is about the unclear perspective of the renewables. Do you think maybe that it's not that much of politics of oil that is or should be discussed, but rather the politics of carbon or the politics of nature? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, the question of carbon prices and carbon trading, I mean, uh, that was, of course, already uh, laid out as, as a, a solution uh, in the Kyoto round and the protocol that came out of Kyoto. Um, but I, I'm sure you're right that it will figure as um, a, a major part of what comes out of Copenhagen as well. Um, I don't have a lot to say about the question of carbon trading. Of course, one of the um, in all, enormous criticisms of uh, carbon trading um, that's been made is that it took what was um, uh, uh, a relatively successful ex prior example um, uh, in the US um, uh, from to do with um, uh, the trading of permits not for carbon production but for um, ozone depleting gases and uh, wanted to extend that to the rest of the world without really considering the specific uh, factors that made that um, uh, mechanism relatively successful within um, a national context, within the context where one was only dealing, one was essentially dealing only with one industry, with, with um, coal-based coal electrical generation and so on. Um, and to extend that to a situation in which um, uh, one is trading carbon permits uh, around the world um, 
uh, and one is trading them between um, uh, entirely different kinds of economic um, or even uneconomic, non-economic activity, future economic activity that is being postponed uh, in exchange for uh, a, a carbon trade. Um, it seems to me produced either um, forms of incommensurability that were, well, it produced forms of incommensurability that were either uh, made the trades themselves enormously difficult or made it enormously easy to circumvent the purpose of the trading because one could come up with uh, fairly fictitious forms of, of carbon producing um, uh, projects in one part of the world and, and use them to uh, uh, justify um, uh, the continuation of, of forms of carbon production in other parts of the world. So uh, it, it's not clear to me that um, those carbon trading um, mechanisms uh, as a global uh, process have, have proved to be workable at all. That said, I, and I think what's interesting about all these things is that they make clear um, uh, that the, the construction of a market is not in any way the straightforward application of a set of economic rules. It's a, it's a political process because um, the, the, there's no off-the-shelf set of rules for doing these kinds of things, and in designing the rules, um, for something such as carbon trading, you are doing the politics. That, that is where the political process um, lies. And opening up a, another area of economic expertise, economic practice, uh, to uh, make obvious the way that this is a set of political, moral, ethical issues and not just a, a set of technical devices that are available to anyone who wants to borrow them is, I think, a very important um, uh, issue for e economics itself. I mean, one sees a very similar process with, um, with the fate of the Stern report. Um, uh, uh, I, I must say, I, I haven't read every word of, of, of the Stern report on um, you know, costing, uh, the co the, uh, costing um, CO2 emissions and costing, the, costing out the, um, the price of uh, reducing those emissions. But um, Two, in, two interesting things that came out of that. One, uh, I understand, I only understand this secondhand from journalistic accounts, that one of the things that happened was that DEFRA took the Stern Report figures and translated them into um, uh, a, a workable definition where so much CO2 equivalent will cost 35 pounds and therefore, yes, we'll have a third runway at Heathrow because a businessman's time is worth more than that. Um, so that uh, um, creating that form, forms of, of, of economic costing or tradability um, can again serve this sort of shortcutting of the politics of nature if it operates in that fashion. Uh, or on the other hand, I think more promisingly, when uh, Sir Nicholas um, presented uh, the um, the annual lecture of the American Economics Association the year after his report came out, um, the Richard T. Ely lecture, of course, named after the man who, who, whose view of the future of economics I mentioned and was certainly not followed, uh, he essentially laid out for them that the economics profession cannot solve this set of issues because we are not dealing with uh, balancing, uh, when, when talking about climate change, we're not dealing with balancing uh, two different equilibria. Um, we're not trying to choose between uh, the catastrophic destruction of the biosphere versus this much GDP. These are simply not um, things that can be um, put alongside each other, though of course there were one or two, I think it was Nordhaus who seemed to think that could be done and we could weigh up and cost um, a 30% uh, reduction in global biodiversity against uh, so many percent increase or decrease in um, global GDP. Um, so, uh, you know, I think these are the kinds of questions opened up by the attempt to um, use forms of economic calculation to address these issues. Um, Rebranding the last two questions. Um, and I, we're running out of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, the rebranding of oil as energy companies is actually very similar to the final question, which is whether this is a broader uh, politics of carbon um, because it involves uh, uh, both the carbon going up into the atmosphere, um, uh, the, the question of the future of, of coal, and the question of renewables. I absolutely agree, and the oil companies um, 
do too. Uh, they are indeed uh, busy rebranding themselves. I mean, uh, BP, of course, dropped the, dropped the logo of Beyond Petroleum, but um, uh, it's nevertheless it and the other um, uh, global oil companies are very much seeing their future as uh, general oil companies, I assume. Um, and particularly with this latest news about the unconventional forms of gas, which uh, are, are going to um, offer all kinds of new energy resources in all kinds of very accessible places. Um, that, uh, that's the case, and the, there's a long history of that. Um, uh, the uh, attempt of the oil companies to continually branch out and rebranch out into other areas, partly because, of course, one of their concerns historically was always to scuttle um, alternative forms of energy that might um, threaten the price of oil. And you saw that with um, uh, the lobbying, for example, right through the 1960s to try and maintain um, a, a high price of natural gas when uh, that threatened to affect oil prices, or um, its adoption uh, in, in the time of the oil crisis of a certain form of the environmental movement in the US. Um, you recall that in the late 60s the, and early 70s, the environmental uh, movement in the US became briefly seriously concerned about oil and oil pollution, just as it did here, Torrey Canyon uh, disaster in 1967 here, a similar disaster in 1968 off the coast of California and on a river, uh, an oil polluted river in Illinois that just burst into flame. It looked like the environmental movement was going to focus on questions of oil. Instead, it was diverted very much into questions of nuclear policy, and, and that was partly with uh, significant funding from the oil industries that wanted them to help make nuclear power unaffordable uh, by alerting people to its dangers and risks and so on, uh, rather than uh, cause problems for the oil industry. So there's all kinds of ways in which the oil companies and their political departments have a long history of rebranding themselves and getting involved in other kinds of branding, and I very much agree that all these issues uh, uh, interconnect and need to be discussed together. Thank you. Thank you very much.